In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we answer fitness and health questions asked by viewers and listeners just like you. But the way we open the episode is with an introductory portion. This is where we talk about current events. We talk about scientific studies, our own workouts. We mention our sponsors. Today's intro portion was 43 minutes long. So if you want to skip that and just listen to the fitness questions, go forward about 43 minutes. But if you want to have fun with us and listen to the whole episode, which is the best way to listen Ooh, to my pump, tight. start in the very beginning. I'm going to give you a breakdown of this whole episode, okay? So we start out by talking about the heat wave here in the Bay Area. It is really hot. Desert people making fun of us. Yeah, right I'm now. waiting for the next uh, plague or something to happen. Then we talked about the inland hurricane, the derecho. Is that how you say that? I don't know. Derecho? It, derecho, Dorito, something like that. Something like that. Then we talked about how a man saved a woman from a great white shark by jumping on the shark and punching him. So it's like a superhero, the most baddest ass man in the world. Uh, then we talked about the episode that we recently dropped. It's carnivore versus vegan. Um, and the, some of our takeaways, uh, we mentioned miracle spring water. This is a new product. Yeah. Being sold to gullible people. We'll heal you. 100%. Uh, then we talked about billionaires and millionaires. How many, what percentage of them I should say are self-made. We mentioned a new study on CBD that shows that it improves blood flow to the hippocampus thus potentially helping you with memory. Um, now, our favorite way to get CBD is with full-spectrum hemp oil. This, because, this is because it has lots of other cannabinoids. It also has terpenes that all work together. In other words, if you have CBD with other cannabinoids and terpenes, it's much more effective than if you just have CBD all by itself. Now, the best makers of full-spectrum hemp oil are uh, NED. They're a company that makes some of the best hemp oil we've ever used. It's high quality, super effective. We like to use uh, Ned's hemp oil for things like relaxation and inflammation. I like to use it for gut health. And because you're a Mind Pump listener, you get 15% off. Here's how you do that. Go to helloned.com. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com forward slash Mind Pump. Enter the code Mind Pump and get 15% off. Then we talked about a new app. That allows you to store your stuff in other people's houses. That's kind of cool. Yeah, here's my junk. Then we talked about how Doug is a phenomenal cook, and he makes incredible ribs, and he used the Heritage Pork Ribs from ButcherBox. Now, ButcherBox is a company that delivers high-quality meat to your door. Eliminates a lot of middlemen, so the price is really good. Uh, they have the best grass-fed beef around that I've ever tried. They have Heritage Pork. Sometimes they also sell fish, so it's a great company. The prices are excellent, and because you listen to Mind Pump, you get hooked up. So to get the Mind Pump hookup, go to butcherbox.com forward slash Mind Pump. Then we talked about an aviation service called Blade. What a cool name. That's right. And by the way, if you want to see all of the timestamps for all the topics in this episode, go to mindpumppodcast.com. So that's the first 43 minutes. Then we got into the fitness questions. Here's the first one. This person says, you guys talk about the muscle building signal can you get into that with a little more detail? Yeah, what frequency? The next question, how important do we think it is for people to have mirrors in their home gym? So like our mirrors are important besides looking at your handsome face, Adam. Ooh. The next question, should teenagers focus on aesthetics uh, after being introduced to resistance training and should they monitor calories and protein intake? And the final question, this person has a question about developing confidence. What do we think you need to do to build confidence? confidence because we're the most confident yeah we're confident in that is that even a question that's right also these are the final hours for our maps suspension launch sale so map suspension is a phenomenal workout program full body that utilizes only suspension trainers that's it all you need are suspension trainers and you can work your back your chest your shoulders your arms your core of course your core and your butt and your entire lower body it's a very effective workout it's suitable for beginners and extremely advanced because you can adjust the leverage with suspension trainers. You can make exercises easy or super challenging. In fact, some of the most challenging body weight exercises are done with suspension trainers. Of course, like all MAPS programs, sus MAPS suspension comes with exercise demo videos so you can learn proper technique and form. It comes with blueprints so you know how many reps, sets uh, to do for your body. It's all programmed out, all written out set up for you to follow. Just get on your phone or go online, follow the program. It's like having a personal trainer. Now, this program is $20 off because it is a brand new program. If you're listening to this episode right when it drops, 
You have a few hours left for this promotion. Here's how you take advantage. Go to mapssuspension.com, M-A-P-S-S-U-S-P-E-N-S-I-O-N.com, and then use the code SUSPENSION20 with no space. And it's t-shirt time. Oh, shit, dog. You know it's my favorite time of the week. <laughs> we have three winners, two for Apple Podcasts and one for Facebook. The Apple Podcast winners are Caffortun and Crip Hippie. And for Facebook, we have Joey Reimer. All of you are winners. Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Include your shirt size and your shipping address, and we'll get that shirt right out to you. You know what I'm waiting for right now, guys? What's that? The 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 locusts and the boils. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was betting on leprosy. Dude. So. We had okay. It got so so. I wasn't in the area, but you know, my, I was talking to my parents. Mm-hmm. It got so hot, and it's going to be hot all week here in the Bay Area. Like it was like a hundred and in inferno, right? But then here's the weird thing. So I was talking to my father in law, and he's like, "Dude, he goes, it was a hundred and two degrees, super hot. It's like insanely hot. Um, and then like at three or four a.m., yeah. he goes." like huge booms and he's like i don't know what the hell was going on yeah he goes a crazy thunderstorm like he's never seen yeah so i was up when when all that was forming so i was still like i was playing poker with my friends we were at this house where you could see uh the skyline and and from the ocean going up over the mountains you could see it forming and coming and there was lightning bolts and all this crazy stuff coming at us it was insane yeah he said it was uncharacteristic lightning yeah like not the kind that we normally get here yeah it also it's got to deal with the heat it also created some of the weirdest weather we've ever had here i don't think i've ever recall uh the Bay Area feeling like that felt outside yesterday. What so, was it? It was just muggy. Oh, it was the it was so, and that yep. it reminds me too of something I wanted to say on the podcast. I'm glad you brought the weather thing up. Was I was I was thinking about the people right now that are out there that are working still, so we could still do things. Like I was at the zoo, right? I took my son to the zoo with my best friend and his son. Oakland and, Zoo, or? yeah, Oakland oh, Zoo. That's a, that's a cool one. And they 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 do it by appointment, so they can limit the amount of people there, and you have to wear a face mask you know, the entire time. But this was my first experience uh, wearing a mask longer than maybe 10 minutes. Like the longest I've had to wear a mask so far is going grocery shopping Mm -hmm. or in a store where it's air conditioned and you're only in there for 10 minutes and you're in and out and then you're taking it off right away. Right. So so I haven't experienced wearing a face mask for like an hour or two hours and then being in the heat and then being out in that heat that created this weird muggy, like tropical type of weird weather out there. I wonder how many people passed out. So uh, so Katrina, we're pushing the stroller. We're about an hour and a half deep in, and all of a sudden go, almost falls down. No, she didn't. Yeah, I reached to grab her, and I thought she tripped over something. I'm like, oh, my God, did you trip? She's like, no. She goes, I just got dizzy and lightheaded. And she took the mask off and sat down for a little bit. But I was like, oh, shit, just from being covered up like that in that crazy hot, humid weather for like two hours, yep. and she got super lightheaded. I thought, oh, my God, if that happened to Katrina, that's got to happen to people. It's not smart, man. Right. You yeah. gotta, there's, there, I'm sure you have to kind of get used to it, right? Because I know some cultures, the, the, the women cover their faces all the time, and it's hot. And then surgeons, right? I used to train a lot of surgeons, and uh, they would do procedures. There was one procedure... I think it was called a Whipley procedure, if I'm not mistaken. It takes like four or five hours. Mm. And you're not going to the bathroom. You're operating the whole time, and you're wearing a mask the whole time. Yeah. So now that I've had to wear a mask for, like you yeah, said, Adam, for like, they probably have controlled air in there. Yeah, but it, it, it's just a new level of respect. Oh, yeah. You know sure. what I mean? You're, no, I know. For yeah, four hours. Be a pussy and like, <laughs> oh, that, I mean, that's uh, what I was thinking about was all the employees, right? That got to do this every day or there probably for five or eight hours out of the day. I know. I know. Like dude. it was yeah, at, crazy. at the two hour mark. And I'm trying to be like, you know, in, enjoy this whole process with my son, right? He's at the zoo for the very first time. And, the whole time though, I'm looking at Katrina. I'm like, God, can we hurry up and just get through this whole thing so we can get out of here? Like it was so hot, and I was so miserable with that thing on my face. Why it was muggy like that? Yeah. So yeah, it just made me think about everybody that is working right now, that is working in those types of conditions. Like, man. Yeah. Well, speaking of the weather too, uh, I was 
uh, brought to my attention, like through DMs, like about what was happening in the Midwest. Did you guys see about the derecho, the sort of inland hurricane that they've been experiencing? What? Yeah. So they've had like over a hundred mile an hour plus winds what? that just like swept through and decimated all these buildings and, you know, all the crops and everything in Iowa and like the whole Midwest just took this massive like weather storm that hit. I've never even heard of just a derecho. In the, just yeah. in the middle of the... How often does that happen, Doug? I'd like to look this up. Yeah, I don't know about that. I just I didn't even know that was a thing. And, uh, you know, because obviously you think of hurricanes being coastal because of, you know, like it coming off of uh, the ocean yeah. and then, you know, forming. And so this is a different thing, but it has the same type of like wind power that just kind of blows I, through. I, I don't want to be... Because, you know, what happens is you start to like uh, strengthen your own bias. Like 2020 is so bad. So then you hear something. Of course. Yeah, I and you're like, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world. It's like happening in little pockets all over the place. Yeah, yeah. so I want to see if that's something that's super, super, like incredibly rare or like if it, it happens, happens right. a few times a or year. Or it happens every 20 years or 10 years, which is- Well, that. that's pretty damn rare still. I, I mean, would think I've never have. heard of one though, you know, so- Yeah, but I mean, every 10, 20 years, let me see, does it, did we mm. say the, the occurrence of derechos is divided into two seasons, the warm season. Okay, so 70% of them occur during these four months- yeah, but how often uh, how well, often do they occur? That's what I'd like to know. Yeah, I mean, if there's seventy percent of them, that means that they happen fairly regularly, right? If yeah. that's if they have a percentage of how many are going on during a month, like right? every year, it sounds frequent, but yeah, how severe it is it must change dramatically. Yeah, because yeah. I'm ser- I mean, I'm seriously like uh, again waiting for the locusts and boils. Like I don't want to be in that dude, state of mind. It's just right? a weird it's week in news. I think. Yeah. Did you see? I see the really the guy in Australia that jumped on the white shark or the a great white and saved his wife. Jumped on a white shark. Yes. What a badass! So, no, I didn't so hear about that. great. They're out. They're out surfing. Great white g- grabs the wife. Actually, grabs her. Yes, grabs the wife. Dude jumps off his surfboard onto the the great white and punches him in the nose, and they and it releases his wife. And Dude, that sa- works. And he saved her life, bro. He's getting blowjobs every day forever now. <laughs> Is that crazy or what? Like, Australia. What a- Oh man! What a badass! Yeah, yeah. Like, you know how scary is that, dude? You see your wife like all of a sudden, you know, get swept up by a shark. I, I'm sure there's some husbands that are going to be like, "Oh crap! Yeah. <laughs> oh no! I'll go get help." <laughs> 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 no, nobody, nobody would say anything, you know. Yeah. Uh, it was a great wife. I had to get, a, you know, I had to get help. Yeah. But what a hero! I know. What a absolute hero for to do that. That's like yeah. the most uh, commendable thing of all time. It's about as manly as it gets, it right, is, dude. Bro. That's yeah. just it, man. Australians, yeah, they, they got some manliness. Yeah, if down you there say, still. You, See, look at wow. He he repeatedly punt. Imagine, like, first of all, it'd be scary to punch a big dude. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. maybe it was maybe it wasn't his wife. I thought it was his wife. Maybe it was maybe it was oh, just, just some lady. Wow, that's oh, even that's crazier. Even just yeah. some random. <laughs> yeah, just some random You're woman. My hero. Yeah, yeah, that's what it said. I mean, even better, right? Yeah. I what mean, a badass. Yeah. Good for him, dude. It was his. Uh, what was it? His female companion. Okay. Wow. Good for him, man. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Hey. Crazy. So so um the episode we did with car uh, with the, that was a carnivore versus vegan that yeah. episode Will and Paul. Yeah, Will and Paul. The ultimate showdown. Yeah, getting getting a lot of great feedback, but it's it's uh, I love it when I leave a podcast feeling like I learned something. Mm-hmm. And um that one there's a couple things that I I picked up that I'm actually that are, are really interesting to me that I feel like I learned. One is I never questioned certain vegetables as potentially causing, um, you know, uh, you know, intolerances for me. Like I never looked at broccoli, for example, and thought to myself, I wonder if this is causing any of my food, you know, if I have any intolerances right, to or it, asparagus right? or something like that. Right. So there's that. And you, you brought that up, Adam. I thought the same thing. And then there was another thing that I really, uh, that, that I took from it, which is we don't place enough value on how we prepare our food mm. because you can really negate a lot of the toxins in foods by how you prepare them. For example, wheat, you know, if you let if you let it sprout and then if you grind it and soak it, that helps eliminate a lot of the, you know, the toxins. Same thing with beans. You ever hear people say if you soak your beans and then you you cook them afterwards, you don't get as much gas or as much gastric distress. Or of course, how you cook your meat mm. and stuff like that—all very important. And I think it's uh, something you sh- everybody should consider. So, if you have foods that you are you might notice you have issues with, you might want to just look at cooking them more to make them you know tolerable. Like I know for me, if I boil the heck out of uh, my vegetables, 
easy to digest a big uh, a big serving. Yeah, I, I think I thought both guys did a phenomenal job. Um, but I do think that if I had to pick a winner in that conversation, it was Paul. And only because of what you just said, and what I think I said after after when we recapped, is after listening to both of them, and both made great arguments, great points, uh, I would not do either one diet uh, permanently. I would never run a carnivore diet permanently. I would never run a, a vegan diet permanently. But after listening to both of them talk, after listening to Paul, it did make me want to go try some things in my diet and change it. So that mm -hmm. to me was a sign of like, okay, he got through to me more than either one of them did just from that point alone, because I was like, oh, you know what? I'd never thought if eliminate, I've never eliminated asparagus and broccoli from my diet before. I would just mm -hmm. never uh, think that that could potentially be an offender. Right. But now I'm going to go try and do that and see if it makes a difference, especially when he talked about he had eczema and I, and I have psoriasis, which are similar related uh, issues. And so if it cleared that up for him, I'm like, oh, I wonder if I've never tried to just get rid of it. The, the vegetables like that. Now, that's the point, too, I feel like I hope that people take from this is not, you know, which diet is better, more so like listening to it and maybe people going like, oh, okay, I've never thought maybe yeah. if I eliminate these things or eat less of them or more of something Considering else. Considering other things, uh, new right. angles. Yeah, I, I definitely like had my thoughts running after listening to that episode. And it's because it's so counter to a lot of the nutrition studies that you, you know, I, I went to you know, college and like when all these nutritional courses, they don't bring any of this information up. So this is all like stuff. I'm like, wait a minute. It makes a lot of logical sense that uh, you know, these plants have developed these defense mechanisms and, and like we are breaking them mm. down in a sense to be able to, uh, you know, get the nutrients out of them in the most effective ways. Yeah. If I could boil down the biggest issue with people and their and diet, um, it would be not listening to your body either because- you don't know how to listen to your body, so you're not aware. So that's the average person, right? The average person just eats food that tastes good, doesn't even know what to pay attention to, and doesn't really know what healthy would be for them. The other side of that are uh, fitness fanatics who also don't listen to their body because they become so they become so dogmatic about a you know diet religion mm -hmm. because they read a study or some muscular person or some lean person tells them to eat a certain way. And so they they hard headedly continue to follow an eating style, yeah. Because they're like, but this is supposed to be this healthy. Is what it says, completely ignoring. Mm -hmm. I've trained women whose hormones were totally off because they were ignoring the fact that, you know, their low carb diet was messing with their thyroid. For example, I've you know trained people who are like who've had repeated uh, gastrointestinal issues. Because they they thought that this particular grain is supposed to be help, healthy, or I thought nuts were really healthy, so I'm just going to keep eating them even though I have terrible bloat and gas every single night. So I think it could all boil down to not listening to your body, either because you don't know how to listen or because you ignore because you I become think, a, so dogmatic. I think the not knowing how to listen is probably the most common because I of think course. He, even somebody like myself who's, uh, I think, more aware when it comes to that. I mean, we all have, are read in the nutrition. We've been in fitness for 20 years. I've been manipulating and playing with my diet. But it, it hasn't been until the, probably the last you know five to 10 years did I really start to hone into like learning to pay attention to everything that I ate on a regular basis. I think so often we just mindlessly eat mm -hmm. and then the bloat, the the stomach issues, the all the skin issues, all the, the the poor sleep, low energy levels. You like by the time it hits you and you're aware that you're dealing with that stuff, like you haven't made the connection of what it could have been in the last 24 hours. Like that's what I feel. I yeah, feel like most people aren't connecting well, those dots. Well, think about it this way, Adam, cuz you and I are very similar in this regard. We paid attention to diet for most of our career based off of uh, aesthetics and strength. Yeah, performance. Right? Yeah, so yeah. it was, I, I I ignored all the other stuff, right? Right, right? And so it was like, what can make me look the leanest? What can mm -hmm. make me build the most muscle? But I was still dogmatic. I was still ignoring all the other stuff. So imagine if, if we went into diet and we had no pre-existing ideas. Nobody told us anything. All we did was go and listen and figure out and listen and pay attention to what made us feel best. I think we would have probably learned that faster. You know well, I mean? well, I have the cure for all this. What is it? Miracle spring water. Huh? <laughs> What's this? Dude, I was watching this. Uh, so I was watching regular TV and like, uh, <laughs> I, I, I forgot about commercials. <laughs> oh my God. There's this whole new hustle of this like uh, televangelist that's like selling <laughs> miracle spring water. It's like this holy water that cures you. 
What? Wow. I was like, wow, what the hell? What were you doing watching regular television? I don't know. I was Where just, I was on there and like, I'd, I, I, I don't know. Like I, I was at my friend's house and I was just like flipping through because we just watched the fights, oh, okay. uh, you know, over the weekend and like that came on and I'm like, okay, so this is a totally new angle. Like they have a product. It's not just like, you know, pay us and we'll pray for you or whatever. It's like, now we got like, we, you know, substantial products going to heal all yeah. your ailments. Yeah, heal all your dehydration ailments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then they can legally do it, right? Yeah. They can list all the stuff that happens it's to you a when, product. You, when yeah. you're dehydrated. Yeah. Yeah. It can solve and cure <laughs> thirst. It can yeah. cure. Dry you know, skin. Yeah, dry uh, skin. Yeah. Headaches, yeah. nausea. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You yeah. know what though? Yeah. That's, that's um, they're, they're obviously exploiting something that's been a part of uh, spiritual practices for a while. Like I yeah. know, I know Lords. I think it's called. Where that's in France. I, I think the water there has been supposedly blessed. Somebody saw a saint there, so people have been traveling there for a long time oh, okay. for experiences. Yeah. And and you know there is. Dude, I just spot out a hustle, like you know, especially in that uh, arena. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh man, that that irritates me the most because you, you know all these people are already like all in their belief. Their belief system is already there, and then now you're gonna exploit that. Uh, with some bullshit like this, like, and get these old people to buy water. Now, how yeah. do you guys feel about that? Like, I know some people get like really angry about that, but then part of me is like, you know, fuck. It if might you're, help if them. you're if you're yeah. a sucker like that. And then there's the other side. Like, what if it does? We, help we've them? talked. Yeah, you, we've talked about like, dude, and the, if the, they, they the can psycho- measure that. Right, the psychological part of yeah. like, if you really believe it, then it is helping. And so, I mean, that remember the uh, what what uh, they talk about that with um. God, what are the drugs that are placebo? Are, effects yes, thank and, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the placebo effects with like your uh, what kind of drugs? I'm uh, painkillers are the biggest ones, right? Like, like they, sugar pills, but yeah, yeah, that they use. And they, there's like a 50 50. I remember Dude, we, we they, debated that in psychology class whether it was, you know, okay, is it ethical to do it, even though there's studies aren't proving that it actually changes it, but that there is enough people that get positive results from it, even if there's if it's the placebo effect. It's mm. it's it's a real thing. There was a study. I brought this up on the show a long time ago, but it's a legit study where they did a fake knee surgery. And my, here's the thing: the the more yeah. that they sell the the realness of the fake thing, the more the more effective it is. What they did is they took people with knee pain and knee problems, and half of them they actually operated and did a legitimate, you know, surgery on them, like a legitimate scope or whatever. Let's let's you know solve these problems in a real way. The other half. The surgeon cut the knee open, sewed it back up, so the people could see that they had stitches, and so they fully believed they had the surgery. Here's the crazy part. At the end of the study, the same pain relief, the same results were seen on both sides. There wasn't a difference. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Shows how powerful the mind is. Very powerful. So you're right. If people buying this miracle spring water, if if, if they're like, I do feel better. Yeah. Well, now I feel bad. You know? (laughs) <laughs> Maybe it is really helping yeah. these old people. Like, like, oh man, like, yeah. my joints don't hurt anymore. Like, praise, <laughs> praise the Lord. There's also a part of me that's like, you know, if you're gonna fall for stuff like that, yeah, you know, then that's your, that's up to you. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, how are yeah. we gonna? As long as you're not a child. Like, if you're a kid, I get that. But if you're an adult, yeah, I think. Yeah. See, that's why I feel like people are buying Snuggy still. So, yeah, yeah marketing and Those advertising to to children is unfair. I feel like, right? But if you're an adult and you buy into something like that, then I'm like, yeah, fair game. That's how I feel. Yeah. About it, yeah. You know? Hey, you know, speaking of buying stuff, so uh, I'll cover this real quickly because I, I brought up some interesting statistics. So California is talking about passing this this crazy wealth tax that's insane. There's no way this is going to fly, though, right? Dude, I mean, is I, it is it really possible this could fly? They so just, well, they want to pour gasoline on our state now. It's like it's not enough that's burning. No, no. Let, I know exactly. Yeah. Listen to this. So the proposed tax uh, rate would be up to 0.4 percent of net worth. So it doesn't matter how much you whatever, just your total net worth, and then the tax will follow you. If you move out, so you're gonna you could you continue will get taxed at this for I don't know how many years. So okay, so let me make this clear then. So let's just say I've been a really good boy over the last 10, 15 years, and I've just been slowly socking money away and saving and saving and and living a very modest life, and I've put away a million dollars. That can be taxed. Is that what you're saying? They'll tax your 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 net worth. Yeah. Yeah. So how much money you're Gavin worth- Newsom, the new Prince John. Yeah, exactly. And then if you move. Then it'll follow you, and I think it's like I think they, I think it follow. I don't remember how many years of five years, something like that. Silly, where if you move out, it's a proposed tax. But this made me look up some statistics because I said, you know, it's 
that we 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 love to tar or politicians I should say love to target and I put in quotes the wealthy because they're an easy target and most voters don't consider themselves wealthy. Right. Oh, that's not gonna affect me. Yeah. So it's and it, <laughs> not it, me. And, it, and it's easy to I look like at this. It's easy to look at someone like I don't know Jeff Bezos, right, and be yeah. like, oh, look at him. You know, he's got all. This. But there's two points I want to make with that. One, they're that wealthy because we give them that much money because they did something a lot of us liked. Right. So I don't know. I feel weird about being upset about that. Like we gave them the money because they did something we all liked. It's weird to be to to want to go after them for that. Mm -hmm. But then, I, but then there's this other part where a lot of people think that millionaires and billionaires uh, didn't earn their money or aren't self-made. Mm, like maybe yeah. they're just whatever. So I looked at the statistic. First of all. Uh, eighty-eight percent. This is huge. Eighty-eight percent of millionaires are self-made, so the vast majority of millionaires mm. earned it themselves. They actually created that money themselves. Billionaires, believe it or not, is less—a lot less than that. Fifty-seven percent of billionaire wealth is uh, is self-made. So some, a lot of these billionaires or inherited, a, inherited, inherit like, a lot of money. And that makes going to be like oil money. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I was going to say that makes sense though, right? If you, mm -hmm. I mean, think if you built this, even in like a big uh, real estate empire, you own 50, 60 properties, yeah. you have a son, then your son comes right in and gets, exactly. to, gets to inherit that and then take that from there and maybe turn it into a billion dollars. Right, right? but check this out. So the mm -hmm. number of billionaires with inherited wealth has dropped 20, 29% since 2014. Oh, wow. So the self-made billionaire number- It's a bunch of new, new billionaires. It's climbing and climbing and hmm. climbing. Uh, it seems to be climbing over the last you know five or, or, or six years or whatever. So this is an interesting thing we should all kind of pay attention to, that a lot of these people got there because they they did something that so, much of, so many of us liked that we voluntarily- Gave them this money, and uh, I don't know if going after them that hard is smart. You know, especially for a state like California, because I, I feel like that'll just drive Doug and I had them this. Out. Doug and I had this conversation leave. on the way home uh, this week, and we were having the Jeff Bezos conversation. Did you know uh, he looked it up? I don't know if you know. You know how many people they employ? You know how many employees he has? No. Almost a million, right? Is that right, Doug? I think it was like wow. eight hundred seventy thousand. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of people. That's like a, that's yeah, like how many other companies can say that? Well, that's what I'm saying. Like he, literally, like a, an entire city, like the size of our city, almost. Right? Yeah. You could like he's employed by himself. Like that's insane to me. And then for people to come after someone like that, I like, got uh, Doug and I were like, spit, like imagine if you're him and you're like just so fed up. You're like, ah, fuck this. I'm closing everything down. I'm yeah. done. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just like I'm shutting everything down. Like it's your company. You can do whatever you want with it. Like imagine if that you got so fed up of like people coming after you and putting you down over shit like that that you decided to shut fucking shop one day, dude. Just yeah. I'm done. I'm closing yeah, shop. You totally yeah. could. Well, yeah. you know what happened? The government would be like, we have to save all these jobs, and then we would all end up paying as taxes to <laughs> yeah, save right. eight hundred thousand jobs or whatever. Right, right. You know. But now they're not doing anything. Yeah. Well, I mean, look. I, you know, it's hard to see the what people like this have produced, um, what their innovations have produced. But I mean, think about it for a second. Amazon is one company. There's a lot of companies right now that I think are, are saving us during this pandemic, but Amazon is one of them. You know, like we're not having to go to the store as often. We're mm -hmm. able to keep getting what we need for low prices. It's very next day. It's keeping things extremely competitive. It's allowing business, small businesses on the internet to, you know, advertise their, their goods and compete with name brand things because of the ratings that, you know, system that they've provided. So Amazon is is one of those companies that's you know. What's helped. our next best thing? Is a U USPS? Yeah. Oh jeez! <laughs> Can you imagine if they were like delivering all of our goods? <laughs> well, you know. you know, for a long time they could. They kept saying it was impossible to deliver things twenty four hours, and then you know, companies <laughs> like FedEx. Yeah, they're like, I would give up. Started doing it, and then they <laughs> figured out you know kind of a way a way to do that. So yeah. anyway, hey uh, hey, so um, I read a, another interest. There was a big study that came out on CBD uh, over the weekend. Did you guys hear about this? No. <laughs> So it was, it's a big one. It just came out. It's, there's a study finds that CBD uh, in, dramatically increases blood flow to certain parts of the brain, mm. in particular the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is important for short term memory, long term memory. And this backs up other studies that support that people who use cannabis along with CBD and other cannabinoids, so not just THC, but with CBD and other cannabinoids that they get less of that short-term memory well, loss. Isn't this, wow. I mean, you're the one that got me to do this. Like, so if I, it's rare now that I like have like a, where I smoke a, a full joint or have quite a bit. Like this has to be a weekend or a time where I'm just like going to cut loose, maybe watch like a funny movie. Then I'm going to have more than like my two little hits to help me go to sleep. 
when I do that, I always make the effort to go and take like a couple of drops of the, the hemp oil. And that's because you're the one who told me that you want to try and keep the ratio one to one and it's for the memory loss. Mm-hmm. And that's what you told me before. And if there's ever a time, anytime I ever feel like that, it's if I smoke too much, I feel like I forget. Well, isn't this the cool part about plants where they have like one certain aspect, but then they balance it out like uh, with another part of the plant. So like if say if one is toxic, they also has the antidote yeah. uh, within the same plant it feels like you know cbd counters a lot of that so short-term memory loss is something you attribute to people that smoke weed well cannabis uh as soon as people started to value it for its hot getting you high effects Mm -hmm. that's what we started to breed uh cannabis for so like early days cannabis was right. we made it really strong and not used to not be like that no Mm -hmm. no early days cannabis i mean you would find you know growing naturally or whatever it would be probably three percent four percent thc now, when you go to a cannabis store, um, especially here in California, it's it's almost it's hard to find anything lower than sixteen or fifteen yeah. percent. Usually, people are, are using twenty percent or higher. Right. Super high THC, but when THC is high, then other cannabinoids are lower. It's not like it produces it produces more THC and the, but it keeps producing more of the other things. So you get this kind of off balance, and it's well known that if you have a lot of THC, you get short term memory loss. That the the you know the dumb stoner. Uh, it's funny know, how this stereotype of, it's, is true. It's funny how this rule applies, I feel like, with us humans. Once we get involved and we start doing things, like if found in nature, if it would, if weed were to just to grow and you were to smoke it, you'd probably be completely fine. But we have found a way to yeah, crossbreed it, it, concentrate yeah. it, to make it crazy strong and then justify why it's okay when the reality is if we would have just probably had it and left it in its n- normal form. Yeah, it's we, natural state. We, we'd probably well, be all right. I mean, this is good news, too, for people who, who use hemp oil and don't really care about THC and they just want the... You know the relaxing effects and the anti-inflammatory effects mm-hmm. that they, if they don't use THC, if they just use hemp oil, they may actually be improving their brain's ability to to you know think sharper or to have better you know short-term memory because it, that's again the study showed well at the bare minimum to stay one to one. I mean you're the one that got me. So this is just another study that really confirms that, right? Because you it knew is. that before. You were the one that made me yeah, privy the, to that. Yeah, the, the, the studies before didn't show the blood flow to hippocampus. The studies before just showed people who had you know, CBD with their THC just uh, had less memory loss. So it was like a like they would do these studies and find, you know, because you can reliably produce short-term memory loss effects in people if you give them high doses of THC for a little while. Then you'll see that their short-term memory starts to get a little messed up. Mm-hmm. But they had people who used CBD along with their, their THC, and they found that wasn't really the case. And that was an old – those are older studies. That's when I, when I brought it to you. But you're right. As soon as we get our hands on something like – yeah, look at fruit. Look how we've bred fruit. Like, there's you can watch. You can look up oh, old. Yeah. Pa- you can look up old Just paintings. Look up a banana. Yeah, like yeah. super super old paintings of fruit, and they're like, that's a banana. It doesn't look anything like no. it's tiny and yeah. has tiny tons of seeds, seeds. Big black seeds in there, yeah. you know. Or watermelons. I remember when I was a kid. And I ate a watermelon. It was hella seeds in that yeah, thing. You yeah, ever? Yeah. Have you guys eat a watermelon? No, they got rid of them. There's no seeds. I don't, yeah. I don't understand. Yeah, they grow they seedless that. ones now. Yeah. Dude, yeah. It's, that's us. It's like, uh, we, just, we just want the man. sugar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just give don't us the sugar. Oh, yeah, so true. Forget, forget oh, all the other stuff. We castrated uh, watermelons. Yeah. You know, I yeah. had some some tech news out to bring up. Uh, there's, a, there's an app out, and I think I brought up a, a similar one. There, this is get, becoming a competitive space. This one's called Neighbor. Um, and it basically, and I talked about one that did something similar before where you can rent out your space. It's becoming like a popular thing, which is interesting to me because I was just telling Katrina right now, we're in this like kind of limbo phase of maybe we're going to move, maybe we're not. And, uh, you know, I went uh, month to month on our place that we're at right now. And so one of the things I'm like, why don't we just like pack up, get everything out of this house that we don't absolutely need on a day-to-day. So if we decide to, to go get a place, then we can just up and move and I'll just put it in storage. And I'm actually exploring this as a, as a possible option because it's becoming so popular and I haven't actually used it here in the Bay Area, but I know that there, these apps are exploding, which allows you to go rent out like somebody else's garage or whatever instead of going to a storage unit. Like a storage unit oh, is X wow. amount of dollars, whatever. You can now these these apps now allow you to go if you're somebody who has a three car garage and you don't use one side of That's your garage, brilliant. Hmm. you could rent it to four or five different people for a certain amount of money every month and collect cash for yourself. You with, think the storage unit business can take a big hit from this? Of course. Yeah. Well, I, I okay. 
should I? Okay, I don't know if they're going to take a big hit because that's like it's been gro- that industry's been growing forever. I thought that yeah. it's, I thought well, that would I be- wanted to get into that, but yeah, I don't know. Like- right, because we keep as as uh, Americans, we keep consuming. We, yeah. We're consuming faster than we can store, so the storage units keep popping up, and there's plenty. But it's just become more competitive. So what I think you would see, mm. maybe you won't see a big hit as much as you'll see like more competitive rates. I don't think it would. Uh, okay, I'm just speculating, but I don't mm. know if it would impact long term storage. But short term storage, I could totally see that. Like if you're moving and you're gonna you just need storage for like a month. Right. You know why, why get a storage unit? Exactly. Now, yeah. now if you're gonna keep something you know in storage for a year or two, I don't think that's gonna I don't think it's gonna impact that. Well, here's where I'm yeah. at. Like if it becomes so competitive, and this is what I told Katrina, like and it's good for the consumer. This obviously. is the type of person that I am. Like, you know, a hundred for a hundred and twenty five dollars, you know, a month or whatever, if it meant I can get rid of a bunch of shit that I have under my in my garage and everything like that, and I can there's maybe somebody in my neighborhood that's doing this. Mm-hmm. And that so it's like literally less than a block or two away from my house and I can go get it if I need it whenever I want to. Yeah. I mean, I would do that. This is all my shit. Is this, for, <laughs> is this for your shoes, Adam? <laughs> there is a part of that. Hey, hey, what, hey uh, what if yeah. you did, what if you... <laughs> you just hit the nail on the head. What if you put all your shoes in someone's garage and then you go back and check on it a month later and the dude's like, was wearing them a bunch of times. <laughs> He's walking around like <laughs> making like, bacon. With just it. happens to be a size 12. Uh, <laughs> so, hey, those are my Jordans. He's got your Yeezy's on and he's gardening. Oh, I, I forgot my shoes inside. It's not a big deal. I'll, I'll, I'll dust uh, them off. So, uh, so hey, so neighbor. Like, yeah. I mean, that does bring up a, a, a point that you think right away. And I looked into this because I thought, well, okay, wait a second. Like, you know, some, you know, regular Joe Schmo down the way, he's going to rent me this space and he's going to have my shit. What if he steals it? What if someone else steals it? What if it's not as secure? Like, you're, you know, part of what you're paying for with these storage units is like the barbed wire fences, the, the cameras, yeah. like the high security, right? But there, uh, in order to be on this app, like or the app company itself is, I, th- I want to say it was a million dollars, like a million dollar insurance policy. Oh wow! Yeah. So if you have, as long as you're storing stuff less than a million dollars, it was the same concerns when Uber came out, right? It was the right. whole thing of like, you know, who knows who these people are? They're not vetted, and you know, they might just Seriously. drive you to Mexico or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? <laughs> oh no, I yeah. didn't think about that. Yeah. Hey, yeah. how you doing? Yeah, can yeah. you take me to the airport? It's Absolutely. Like, didn't happen. Yeah. Hey, yeah. by the way, do you have uh, both kids? Kidneys? Why, why do you ask? Yeah, no, 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 no reason. Yeah, no reason. Yeah. You know, that's what they said about eBay. eBay yeah. was one of the first uh, companies to do that. Where And everybody, all the retail companies said, no way this will work. There's no way this will work. People are going to get ripped off. The, the, the satisfaction rates are going to be terrible. And the funny thing is eBay's, uh, like the trust factor with eBay or how often that they people are, are good on there is just as good as any retail. Yeah. Like so any other market. What, what I'm curious about now then is like, okay, so because some of these properties that I've been looking at too, they have like a little bit of land. So like an acre or two or whatever. Like what is to stop me from building like a shed on my property? And just doing that. Sure. And just doing that. Just hustling it in. And yeah. having, you know, 20, 30 sheds on there to collect monthly income to help pay for the mortgage of the place. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I, I wonder have I wonder if you're going to start to see like similar, like you brought up the Uber thing, is the taxi company is going to freak out or all the storage unit company is going to freak out and start to try and legislate against the ability to do that. Like I, right now- this might be one of these things that we see that grows so fast. Like I don't mm-hmm. think a lot of people are aware of this. Yeah. No, it'll get too big. If it's good, it'll get big f- too fast for legislators to to mess with. And then yeah. by the time it's that big, then it'll be a battle. Like right. We like we by like, keep your yeah. eyes open. You might see this. That's a mass. Like the storage industry is a massive industry mm-hmm. that it just kind of flies under the radar. Not a lot of people talk about it. Here's these apps that are starting, and I, I've seen quite a few of them. I told you about Not the park one, the neighbor one now, and I forgot what the other one was called. But you know, people are able to rent their parking space in front of their house. You know, so. you could rent your couch. Yeah, did you guys know that? Yeah, couch. The, yeah, the, that someone one's could weird. Spend a night on, on their couch. couch surfing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. This makes they, me. They do this with uh, you know what else they do is like pools. Like so, that's popular right now where people that pool have, parties. Yeah, well, just having a pool at your house. The heat wave coming through right now, and you can't. And if you're not in town, you're not using your house or whatever like that. You could rent Dang. your pool out. That's for the such day. a liability. I wouldn't want anything to do with that. Well, no, I mean, it sounds if like you it. own a pool. Uh, dude, no way. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I don't like that. I don't yeah. like it. Yeah, someone could drown, or you could have some creep. 
just you know what I mean? Any yeah, yeah. Uh, that yeah. one's. Hey, like, I'm renting my no pool thanks. for any college uh, graduation parties. <laughs> yeah. uh, They're jumping you know, off your roof. I'm gonna like, watch. Yeah, I'll Instagram. be on the roof watching yeah. just in case anybody drowns or whatever. I mean, it's just like you, you I mean you say that, but it's like what's the difference between that and VRBO or Airbnb? The same right, risk. Yeah. You're right. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah, you're, a, right. you're just you're you're only limiting it to the pool versus yeah. the whole house. It yeah. just feels a little more like yikes. Yeah, but you know the thing you said about the the store, you know, having people store stuff in your garage, and then you said a million dollar policy. The bad side of my, me is just thinking of the scams people can run where you'd be like, hey, dude, come put your stuff in my garage. Somebody will steal it. Don't worry. Insurance will give give you a, Yeah, but you know. okay. So now, now what I think about, and mm-hmm. that's the beautiful thing about eBay, Ubers, is like, I'm sure there's a rating system on this. And if this guy's known for getting- Don't watch patterns. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you look it up and he's got a, a two-star rating because his place has been jacked twice, are you going <laughs> to are you gonna drop your shit there? Like, no, I'm not going to store it there. So it'll it'll self-regulate, yeah, right? Like, right? So maybe somebody gets away with a scam like that yeah. once or twice, you know, but after a while- People won't drop their this stuff guy's there. Super cheap. Oh, he's only got two stars. Yeah, 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 exactly. Dude, I forgot to tell you guys what my my son said about you guys when we were up at the house. Whoa, whoa. Or maybe I did text you. It was hilarious. We're sitting uh, there, yeah. and uh, we're all having conversation. Or whatever. he goes, <laughs> he goes, uh, Doug's a he's a really good cook. He's also really funny. He yeah. said, Oh, that's that's cool. Yeah. He goes, Justin. So he started kind of breaking everybody down. Yeah. He yeah. goes, Justin's like a he kind of sounds like a surfer dude. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah he, I'm like yeah, he yeah. does. Yeah. Like, and he's yeah. like, Adam's a dad. <laughs> I don't, like I don't know. I don't that's know that's a compliment. That, that is you. not a compliment from a high school kid. It's <laughs> yeah, no. definitely not a compliment from a funny guy. School. Adam's the what? dad, dude. I went yeah. from I'm yeah. some surfer, bro. Yeah, he's like Doug, yeah. Was, man. It's so funny to hear different perspectives. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, especially he, from a kid like that because it's completely pure, right? Like, yeah. there's he's not biased or yeah. anything like that. Oh no, he's my like, kids love you guys though. That's what they kept saying, dude. I've been trying to get rid of the surfer accent forever. It's still, dude. Bro, you grew up, even though you grew up rid of it, even though you grew up in the mountains, you grew up in Santa Cruz. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's just right now. I mean, it's ten minutes. I away. would way rather be the buff surfer guy, though. I mean, if that's yeah. what he's really than than the dad. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll and I'm proud to be part. a dad. Don't get me wrong, but that's not the compliment you want from a high school kid. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. he's a dad. I was like, what do you mean by dad? He's like, yeah, yeah the way he dresses. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, right to the heart. <laughs> hey, s- speaking of Doug, though, Doug uh, Doug is quite the chef. Him and I have been going back and forth yeah. on, on battling on the uh, the rib recipes, and I heard you nailed one out again uh, lately, Doug. Yeah. I think that's what won Domenico over, right? Well, yeah, Your I made ribs. the Korean barbecue ribs when oh. I was uh, with the kids, but I've been working on my baby back ribs wow. on my Traeger here for a while, and I've been using the fall off the bone recipe you find on the Traeger site Oh uh, yeah, with the butcher box uh, ribs, but I wasn't actually nailing it. It wasn't working for me. So I what, what made were you some... missing? Well, for one thing, I was getting them overcooked. And I wasn't getting that fall off the bone thing that I was going for. So uh, I just tweaked a lot of different things like the smoke time. And then I put them in a foil pan with apple and grape juice. Mm. And then I put foil on top, really seal it well. And then I kind of steam it in there on, on the grill. And I extended that out another 15 minutes. And then I shortened the back end where you turn up the heat and you brown the ribs. So... The last time I did it, they're super juicy. They fell off the bone. It was a, that's real amazing. similar to how I do it. I, use, I do brown sugar, brown sugar, honey, and apple juice inside the foil, but almost identical to. You know what I haven't been able to do is, and I don't know if it's because I've been cooking so much of the butcher box meat is. Somebody else uh, gave us some ribs. I don't remember. I think it was Katrina's mom uh, gave us some ribs, and I cooked it, and they were, they were terrible. So I, I've gotten used to cooking mm-hmm. that size uh, of rib, I think, and that anything else that I've tried to cook, I'm the, off now. The fatty acid profile is going to be different, too. Um, it's because it's grass-fed, probably, yeah. right? So, well, I don't know if the ribs are grass-fed. Are they the, the pork? Um, oh, the her- heritage pork. Heritage, heritage pork. Yeah. Still going to be a little different. Yeah, right? it's going to be different, definitely, because yeah. they give them good quality food. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely different. Like I, I and I, like I said, it took me a while to get them down. Now that I have them down really well, it, like if I've gone to cook other ribs, I have not been able to hit it out the park. Well, the you guys way. are scientists with the way you guys uh, grill meat. I, I've never really paid attention that way. I grill it and then I eat it. I don't know. I don't do the timing and all that stuff. But there's definitely a difference when I eat meat after you guys make it. It's an incredible experience. Well, no. I mean, you know, meat's good, right? I don't. As long as you don't overcook it, it's gonna be fine. 
But you guys definitely bring a whole new level. Well, are you not? Do you are you not a big griller? Do you do you grill a lot at home? Or? I grill a lot, but I definitely don't do what you do, where mm-hmm. you know you made us all steaks, and he runs in and he goes, "Put the timer on for yeah, two he's minutes." Get the timer. Yeah. He's got <laughs> Let the, me know when two minutes, and I learn the to, searing right yeah. at the pivotal uh, moment. Yeah, to like, keep the like, juices oh, in. Two yeah. minutes is up, and then he does his <laughs> thing, and then he closes yeah. it, and then he watches the, the temperature, and then yeah. let me know when another two minutes is up, and then the t- and then he'll open the thing for I don't know how many seconds, close it, and like, what's he doing? Yeah, it's, you know. But the steak comes out incredible. Talk about like. The difference between a cook and a chef, like anyway, that one of them has is more formulaic, right? Uh, versus the other one's a little bit more create, like is is kind of adding things and adjusting and all that. So, but I like I grill on on uh you know Weber, and so it's like I'm always there, like having to manipulate and mess with it uh, the whole time to make it like taste good. I love I love charcoal, yeah, yeah. but it, but taste. it tastes good. Well, all, it takes another. Yeah. I mean, it takes another. I mean, my brother in law, who's like the total foodie, right? He's his theory is that like you know it, he's a purist so like everything has to be on a charcoal oh yeah like all these cool things like the traeger we're talking about and i mean it's like you could cheat i mean you could i could that's and that's just it is like so for me it's about the end product i want the best i want to try and emulate the best steak that i've had yeah, in a right. restaurant. and replicate it yes yeah, so right it's like the like, next time yeah the that's that's my goal you're right? not like oh this is the way cavemen did it Everything yeah yeah else is, uh, <laughs> yeah no. it's too much i'm like if i got the cool thing to, to measure the temperature of the meat and i got the gauge to measure the heat in there like okay and i could figure this out i can replicate like the perfect steak almost every time now yeah but with the weber you don't get that you don't get a temperature gauge or anything you so you're watching yeah you're watching it's all your, my feel almost. yeah you're eyeballing yeah. it and so i mean <laughs> Which, if you're a purist, like you, you appreciate that. But I'm like, I just want a great I feel steak. my meat. Yeah, j- yeah, just it's easy. The I'm force. I'm feeling it. You, you know that, right, Adam? Uh, <laughs> yeah. He's like, this, mm, see, feels right. More ways of the Jedi. Yeah. Speaking of grilling, almost uh, the, the the barbecue caught fire again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish I could be there when that happens for you. I could just see Sal. you, you ah, yeah, freak yeah. out. No, bro. It's okay. First, I got to clean the barbecue. And then I t- turn it on. I leave it there to heat up a little bit. I go back. I turn. It, I open it up and the thing's on fire. I yeah. like that, though. No, mm. I don't like that kind of fire. Yeah, because it gets so... With, what? Well, here's a, <laughs> here's a downfall of cooking in a, a really clean gas barbecue all the time. You may as well use the fucking oven. Mm. Then it's like an oven. Because no, it, the oven doesn't cook it like that. Very similar. If you don't have, the, if you don't got a good flame coming off there every once in a while. But I'm talking about the pan underneath was yeah, a flame. Yeah, right? Okay, Justin was there when it caught oh, fire. Yeah, 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 I saw it. Well, yeah. yeah. Hey, if you close the fucking thing and you walk away and you got greasy ass meat or fatty meat on well, there, like it will yeah. definitely light that. That's gonna I mean, keep it an was eye just on. Overwhelming it. the volume of dripping grease when we did it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, like that, oh. yeah, when you had all those burgers on there. Sent like, you guys oh. an angry text. Oh yeah, especially a bunch of burgers for sure. We'll do yeah. that. I didn't have anything on it, by the way. Well, yeah, I was just heating it up. From, yeah. Well, I mean, we just cooked 12 three inch fucking ribeyes <laughs> in there back to back nights. So there's definitely some some residue left over from that for sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, those were good, by the way. Those, those, those steaks. Those were really good. Yeah. I, in fact, when I got home, I wanted more. So I went to the store and got myself. Uh, did you really? Yeah, I did. After back to back nights like Dude, that? Dude, yeah. I, I, they're so good. So good on the gut. Yeah. Well, Doug, man, I, I, I got that's something I got to steal from Doug. What a dad conversation, he, by the way. It's so great. <laughs> I'm talking about, talking about barbecuing. Yeah. <laughs> The perfect it's like about new balance next. Yeah. Huh? Guys, yeah. Well, you. Doug does the mush, the mushroom and onions, man, to put over the top of the ribeyes. That's the that's the kicker. Oh man. my god! Yeah, yeah those onions alone. Yeah. So my daughter's never loved uh, mushrooms, and in the ones you made, Doug, she was like requesting them now. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> thank you for doing that. You're hey, welcome. <laughs> hey, you know you brought up uh, California transition out of this this barbecue man talk here, yeah. dad talk. Um, yeah. So I wanted to bring up something that I thought was interesting. Lawn mowers. I know. Yeah. I, was just thinking that. I, was like, <laughs> I want my grass. No, length. like uh, a lot of people uh, leaving like the cities and stuff. And so over in New York, uh, you're seeing a lot of the, the people that own like the Hamptons and they travel there for like summer, like are now staying there. Mm-hmm. And so this is also allowed a company called Blade, which is an aviation helicopter company that is like blowing up right now because so many of these these uh, execs that live in New York that have a house in the Hamptons yeah. are staying in the Hamptons and then they're commuting back and forth using this aviation. Dude, what a Which, sick name for a company. Right, a blade. blade. <laughs> Wait, so they're taking helicopter to work? Yes. Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> well, I, and I'm, I'm sure it's not an everyday <laughs> thing, right? So you're you're taking it once a week maybe, you're going back, but you're working from home like 80, 80% of the time Dude, right Magnum now. Dude, Magnum PI uh, pulled it off. Yeah, yeah what, I mean, a, what a yeah. flip. 
flex. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, totally. I'll, I'll be at the meeting. Don't worry. You yeah. know? <laughs> What's that sound outside? <laughs> walk out with your briefcase. That's when yeah. you know we've officially made He's a walk show in to slow one of our motion. events in a helicopter. Where is yeah. Adam at? He's not here. He's, yeah. he's... <laughs> yeah. You got to have a briefcase. You know, you just have to carry something. Justin will arrive in it. Like <laughs> with a... like protein bars no, in it? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Justin will arrive in a pers- personal like rocket pack. That's what I see him doing. <laughs> Adam shows up in the helicopter, yeah. Justin one ups it. Oh, yeah. I, I seen that too just That'd recently that somebody was driving, flying one of those. Was it you who shared that article? One yeah. of you guys shared an article yeah. of someone flying around one of those. There was one where this guy was flying and he had like two independent, yes. uh, yeah, like engines that I don't know what kind of engines they were, but they were like on his arms and he was flying around an aircraft carrier. Yes. Just, yeah. I was like, dude. Super safe. Yeah. We're Iron Man now. <laughs> First question is from Damien Leverett Fitness. You talk a lot about the muscle building signal. Can you explain this more and how to know if your workout is adequately creating this work without working to working to all out failure or going beast mode all the time? Thanks, you got to have, have good Wi-Fi. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. got to have good Wi-Fi to get that signal. Yeah. No. So, mm. um, dang, here's a That's dad a good joke. Point. That yeah. was a That's, dad joke. Uh, <laughs> That was not bad. Good try. <laughs> so, so all right. So, have some boosters. This was a big, uh, you know, big moment for me as a trainer. I remember when I finally made the connection that the workouts, all my workouts did was send a signal to my body so that my body could adapt. That's really all it was. It wasn't about beating myself up. It wasn't about getting sore. It wasn't about lifting the most weight. Those are all components of the workout potentially. But really, the workout was about sending the right signal. So once I understood that, and I really, I really got that, then my workouts got much more effective because then when I would go in, I would think to myself, am I sending the right signal? Am I living in a way that's going to cause more adaptation? So your muscles, first of all, um, don't necess- they don't really maintain in, in the sense that they don't just stay the same. They're constantly building or reducing. The way you build muscle is the building process is – stronger or over outweighs the breaking down process or the the atrophy process. And by the way, the atrophy process can be very powerful. If you put your arm in a cast for a week and then took it off, just a week, you would see significant weakness and atrophy of your arm in that short period of time. So this it's like this constant battle that's going on. But the way you approach your workouts should be, is this workout producing the desired result, which is or which can be getting stronger, uh, maybe building muscle, getting leaner, improving my mobility. Is that what's happening? Or am I just going to the gym and satisfying my ego by lifting m- more weight than the guy next to me or by beating myself up so now my ego is satisfied because I had this crazy hard workout? Now, what determines uh, whether or not it's the right signal for you is super individual. Yeah. This is the thing now. It's very individual. The right workout and the right dose for you is the best dose, um, and it may not be the right dose for the person next to you. There's a couple things you could watch. One of them is uh, soreness. In the past, I thought getting really sore was a great sign. Later on, I realized uh, a little bit of soreness is okay, but a lot of soreness means I overdid it, and I need to back off a little bit. That one's one signal I like to watch. Well, this really came full circle for me when I I finally grasped the difference between adaptation and recovery Hmm. for most even my training career i i explained this wrong to many many clients so i feel bad about this um because i was still under the impression that we and we go to the gym we tear and we break down like Mm -hmm. that was like how i explained we tear and we break down these muscle fibers the body then signals it to you know oh my god we tear these down we got to recover them and we got to make them stronger and so that was the adaptation process where where I was missing the link here was that it's not just this recovery process of recovering from the damage. It's also this adaptation process. And I think, Sal, you explain it really well, and you've done this on the podcast several times where you use the analogy of the suntan, right? And burn, like you could go out, like if I, if I haven't been in the sun in, in a long time and I go out and I lay out for like three hours, I will burn my skin. Now I definitely will get a little tanner, I say, but also burn it. Like and it'll like it'll hurt and I'll be peeling mm-hmm. and I'll get a little bit of color from that, but it, then you lose it. Right. And then I lose it and I don't want to go out in the sun anymore because I'm burned already. And so I think of it like that because if I go out in the sun for 10 minutes at a time though, every single day, 
over the course of like two weeks, I'll also see that I got as tan, if not more tan, but I didn't have to lay out there mm -hmm. for three hours and go through the whole burning process and the healing process, right? So I think of it the same way now with like training is I'm looking for that sweet spot. Like I want to train hard enough to where the body adapts and it starts to build muscle because it, it recognizes the signal that I'm sending to it, but I don't want to damage it so hard that my body's just trying to recover all the time from the sun or from the workout. So you're looking for that sweet spot of getting the benefits of both of the adaptation process and the recovery process. And you don't want that constant, like hammering it so hard that all yeah. the body is thinking about is trying to recover. You're not allowing it also to adapt. I think a major adjustment I had to make uh, once started to understand this, this whole principle, uh, you know, a bit, a bit more in depth, uh, was to, you know, really evaluate where, like, if, if I were to like approach my workout and try and find that like optimal dose, like it was a lot easier for me to exceed it. So in terms of like intensity or like overdoing it, it was very easy uh, for myself to, to go beyond that versus, you know, approach it from less and then kind of build my way up uh, to, to try and find and hone in what that, uh, you know, that particular dose was for me. And so I started to adjust the way I train people because I was always under the impression that I need to ramp up their intensity to get them to get more work out of it, which then would produce, you know, a better result to get them more muscle. But it was actually the opposite. Opposite I found where when I started reducing the intensity and then building it back up slowly uh, and not like trying not to overdo it, uh, they had better results. I, I think this is a, there's a real simple way to give people advice listening right now because I really think that there's a, there's two groups here. If I'm talking to a client <clears throat> who is a complete beginner, lifting weights, really, really unaware, like they uh, they need a little more intensity in their life. They're less likely to hammer themselves every time they go in the gym. They're more intimidated, scared. They ease themselves in. And so getting that person to, to learn to kind of push and stretch themselves a little more, I find myself having that conversation. If you're the person who likes to go to the gym, you've been lifting weights for years, you're more of an advanced lifter, you're more likely to fall in the category like I think all three of us in this room, which is I'm more likely to overreach than I am to go into a gym and train and not do enough mm -hmm. because I've chased that sore feeling and I and I've I've learned to like that feeling. So I tend to go work out and go like, oh, I need yeah. to feel that crazy burn or I gotta feel that sore the next day to feel like I got a great workout. And that's not true. And so I'm always, I mean, I just did this the other day with Doug. I worked out with Doug up in Tahoe. And I was joking about how like roasted my back was because I hadn't deadlifted in a long time. I'd hurt my foot this, and I'd been out from like squatting and deadlifting for a while. It was my first time deadlifting back. I told Doug I'd just lift what he's lifting, and I didn't realize he was going to go heavy that day. And that, I, was, that was light for Doug. Yeah, 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 right. yeah it was a light day. For so me. I was I was lifting with Doug, and you know uh, my ego was like, okay, I'm not going to go peel weight off. I'm lifting with Doug. I'm yeah. supposed to be the trainer, supposed to be stronger than him. So I lifted right with him. <laughs> And I was fried for the next three days, like absolutely yeah. fried from it. And that's just, I still, even all these years, even after giving advice on this podcast, still have a tendency to overreach. And that's not the goal for maximum results. You want to just yeah. stretch yourself. Yeah, a although bit. I do have to bring up the point. So the, um, the beginner, I think a lot of times, like they don't understand what that line is. And so even, you know, what may seem to be like a normal workout may be way too much for them. True. And oh. so, you know, like they, they have to find that balance before they can even, they have to be able to ramp it up very slowly. I, I still go with the slow approach with them. Yeah. The muscle building signal, understanding that is what uh, allowed me to initially create uh, MAPS Anabolic because I sat to my, I, I sat down and I said, okay, it's all about sending a signal. And I know lifting weights sends that signal. What other things could potentially send a muscle building signal? One of them is a hormonal signal, right? You could give anabolic steroids to someone, the hormonal signal builds muscle. Could I send other muscle building signals that are natural that don't include beating the crap out of myself? This is the, the trigger session concept. And I'll say this for most people, you'll get better results with uh, more frequent, less loud signals than you will with less frequent, super loud signals. In other words, you're better off doing easier workouts five days a week than you are doing one super hard, massively intense workout for a week. Sure. This is true for most people. It's still true for myself. Even today, I'm incorporating some trigger sessions here and there. And the goal, the results I get every time I do this consistently blow me away. And it's a low intensity, 
muscle building signal that that just it just compounds on top of the tradi the normal signals I send, which are with my normal workout. So this is why frequency is so important because frequent lower level intensity workouts, they don't send a loud signal, but they send a signal and they don't create a lot of damage. And so what they do is they just compound on top of your normal workouts. So if you're not incorporating things like trigger sessions or focus sessions, give them a, give them a shot. Next question is from S Costanzo 430. How important do you think it is to get mirrors for your home gym? Oh, well, any <laughs> trainer will tell you that that <laughs> mirrors, if you're working out alone, are super important. Because as a trainer, one of your jobs was to watch your client's form. And I, I, I'll tell you what, yeah. people are so unaware that their form is off, that one shoulder's a little high, that mm -hmm. their hip moves in one direction a little bit, that there's a little bit of an imbalance. This happens to me. Um, and I'm advanced. I've been working out for a long time. So mirrors help you watch your form and pay attention to like mm -hmm. when I do curls, for example, the simple exercise like curls, when I watch in the mirror, I'm very careful to not allow my left shoulder to hike up a little bit because that's it's the tendency. The tendency is when it gets heavy and hard, my left shoulder wants to wants to shrug up a little bit. And if I didn't have a mirror, yeah. I wouldn't be able to notice that. Just I wouldn't don't feel make it. love to yourself in the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Why are you looking at me? That's Adam's I'm just saying. saying. No, yeah. this is this is actually it might seem like a silly question for some people, but I think it's a it's a good question because I used to get clients that would say things like, "Oh my god, you know, I I don't ever want to be one of those people that are so narcissistic they're standing in front of the mirror and they're watching themselves work out the entire <laughs> That's not what I know as if they're looking at them it's like oh, I know yeah, well yeah, and and, yeah, and, and, and let's be honest <laughs> there, there is there is that side too right yeah. there is there is uh you know guys that can't walk to the water faucet without checking them their tricep out and their shoulder out at least three or four times in the mirror on the way there so there is that level of narcissism and I could see how they could turn off somebody who's not like an avid lifter in the gym but I think their mirrors are absolutely necessary. Yeah. And I every exercise I do, I do in front of a mirror if I can. And it's literally because you're I I'm I care about the movement so much that even to this day, an exercise that I've done a hundred or a thousand times, I still always think there's room for perfecting it and making yep. it look even better. And so it's not about you and what you what I look like in the mirror. It's more about what my movement looks like. And without a mirror, I can't do that. Or without somebody it's standing there. feedback. Can, yeah. No. Yeah, it's, you know, yeah, you got to see what your body is doing to compensate. Because it inevitably, like, based off of patterns throughout your day, you could throw off uh, your mechanics. And it's just, uh, it happens to the best of us. So it's one of those that you just need to see how to make little micro alterations uh, w within your lifts to make sure everything's on point. It keeps you, it helps keep you, it's not perfect, right? But it helps keep you objective to your form and your technique and how you're you're moving away. Just like, I mean, it, it, I, our podcast is a bit of an example. I mean, the first, you know, I don't know, 100 episodes that I listen to myself talk, first of all, you hear your voice and it sounds way different mm -hmm. uh, on, on recording than you hear in your head. So first you get comfortable. Then you realize how you sound and how you communicate things and you make adjustments. It's hard to be objective in the moment and when you can't necessarily watch or see or, or listen to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's what mirrors provide. That's why gyms have mirrors. And if you have a home gym, I think a mirror is uh, one of the essential pieces of equipment, just as essential as a dumbbell, a barbell, or a bench or a resistance band. Uh, yeah, otherwise, or unless you are sitting there and recording yourself and then going back and watching it every single time. Yeah, but you, then you mess yeah, up. That's it's a like, little more weird. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. It, but it's better to fix exactly. Yeah, it's better to fix it while yeah. you're doing. No, hundred percent. I'm yeah. agreeing. You know, I was like, that would be my only. If I didn't have a mirror in a, in my at home gym, that would be the thing that I would have to do. Like, mm -hmm. if I didn't have a mirror to look at it, then I would I would definitely record stuff. So I, especially comp complex movements, especially if I'm doing like a squat or a deadlift or a snatch or a movement that I want to see. Am I, where am I breaking down if it's not perfect? Next question is from Connor Nagel 07. Should teenagers focus on aesthetics after being introduced to resistance training and should they monitor their relative caloric and protein intake to accommodate their fitness goals. Okay, so let's let's answer the first part, which is aesthetics. Now, uh, being a teenager is probably good, good luck telling them not. To. Yeah, I know, exactly. Right? <laughs> that's yeah. like the, the. I would say that. Stop that. That's when you start to get to the peak of uh, insecurities. I would say teenagers start to become aware of a lot of these different types of things. Um, I think one of the keys uh, with fit, and I actually train a lot of teenagers. One of the one of the most beneficial things I did for teenagers was to get their focus off of their aesthetics and move it more towards things like 
strength, mobility, and how they felt because mm-hmm. they already focus so much on how they look. If you turn their workout into how you look, if it's all about how you look, you 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 are very likely to create a negative relationship with exercise and resistance training. This is where body image issues, because here's the thing with working out. Working out can either really help you with your body image issue, or it can be just as powerful in the opposite direction and create really, really bad relationships and habits to where you might have been a little insecure about your body, but now because it's all about your body, you blow up this insecurity. You know, I've trained, uh, you know, uh, bikini competitors and I've trained a couple male uh, competitors and they told me that their body image issues got far worse when they were competing because they were- Of it, course, it, exaggerates it. Was, it. It, was, it was all about how yeah, they looked. The judges course. were constantly looking at and critiquing their bodies. I, yeah, I, in fact, when I train teenagers, I don't ask them. I never ask them. So I, I'll do this with adults. Like, okay, well, what areas do you want to focus on? Yeah. How much weight do you want to lose? What are areas of your body you'd like to shape and sculpt? I don't even ask those questions of teenagers. It's not even a question. I don't say to a teenager, how much weight do you want to lose and what part oh, of your teach body- Teach them do- the fundamentals. Yeah, do you want to shape and sculpt? That's not my question. I'll say, what are your goals? And if they say something like that, then I'll kind of maneuver about around it. But it's all about how you feel, performance, everything. But See, I find this a kind of a difficult one to answer. And and maybe I'll be more qualified when my son is at this age. Now, I feel, Sal, you're going through this right now. So I think you're more than qualified and maybe can share like the conversations you have with your son. Because there's the other side of me that like, hey, if you're a kid, like, like if my son, which is a good chance that he'll grow up to be very skinny and lean and tall like I was, and he starts to piece together that he can change that through lifting weights and he wants to, I feel like there will be a very fine dance I will have to try and do. Like, I know that I want to give him those tools. Like, I don't want to be like, son, I, I'm not going to teach you how to lift or eat to build muscle or to look a certain way when you want that, right? If that's what he's asking to do. So, But then I also want to educate him on the dangers of that, of going down that and, and allowing those insecurities to drive his motivation. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, as a father, I hope that he's so into basketball that all of our workout conversations around performance but I have to be realistic and think that there's a good chance that might not happen. Yeah, I'm not saying be afraid. I think that will also do the same thing. If it's like, oh, hey, Dad, how do I get my arms bigger? And you're obviously avoiding that. Right. That's what that's I'm saying. Different. That's yeah. why it's got to be like a fine dance because, yeah. you. I mean, because there's a, there's a positive side. How cool is that if you're a, a dad who is uh, or a mother who is a trainer and you have that knowledge and you have a daughter or a son that – you know, they want to start sculpting and building their physique and they they admire what you, maybe you've done your entire career or life or the way you maintain yourself as a 50-year-old adult or whatever. Like, you know, so maybe now they're interested in that. There's there's the part of me that wants to give him that gift. Like all the, I had to learn a lot of hard lessons, you know, through 20, 20 years of lifting that I could hopefully fast track him to, you know, the ideal way to eat and train early. Mm-hmm. And I want to be able to give that to him, but then also understanding that that also can lead to some major insecurities. And so, yeah, I feel like there's going to be kind of a, a little bit of a dance there. It's so different than when I have a parent who hires me to train their kid for whatever reasons. That's one thing. But having this conversation with my son I think will present yeah, different I, challenges. I've had this already. So my son, you know, we were working out. I don't know, it was like a month ago, and he's like, "Hey, how do I get my arms bigger?" And so my response is, "Okay, if you get stronger at at pull ups and at bench press, then the side effect of that is bigger arms." That's the conversation. That's how I bring it up. What I what I don't think is a good idea is to teach them how to break their body down. Okay, so you need more delts here. And maybe if your pecs got a little bit better so get all and bigger, about it. exactly. Yeah. But if they focus on things like how can I get stronger, how can I move better, mm-hmm. the side effect of that being um, I'm going to look a certain way, I think that's a healthier approach. Now, as far as calories and proteins are concerned, um, I think it's important that you educate them on what those mean. But I also think it's important that you don't create this crazy monitoring structure with their food where they're counting things. But I'll have conversations like this with my kids where they'll say, hey, can we have, you know, pasta for dinner? I'm like, oh, we got to have a little bit more balance. We've had a lot of, we had more carbohydrates this morning. So I think tonight we're going to have more proteins and fats. Or I'll say things Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. proteins and fats are essential. Your body needs those. So we're going to hit those first. Carbohydrates, uh, not bad, uh, but they're not essential. So, you know, it's not as important that we, you know, seek those out, for example, or you know, this food provides this particular nutrient. This is a good idea that we eat this because 
you know, maybe you're getting a cold or something like that. So yeah. when it comes to that conversation, I'll do that. But the, the, the like tracking um, and like count those things and you got to hit these numbers. Ooh, I, I don't know if that's necessarily a good path to go down. Really, yeah, we're trying to bring it back to like healthier conversations yeah. about uh, yeah macronutrients and like how it benefits your body overall. Uh, I mean, same as I look at with like like the pursuit of having bigger arms or like having shredded abs. I know, like, I mean, this is just stuff that kids even talk about at school already, and right. I think it's just uh, because of Instagram and it's because of things where. Uh, you know, people notice things about bodies early on and they're mm -hmm. like, why does he look that way? And and so, I mean, I'm, I'm already having these conversations with yeah. my kids. And so it's just one of those things. It's I try to like understand that these are, you know, pursuits that some kids have and they they like the fact that like maybe they're showing off their muscles at the pool or whatever. But. Uh, you know, trying to bring it back to a healthier uh, objective of that is if, if, you know, if that's benefiting their overall health, then, you know, there's nothing wrong yeah, with that. I can already see though, that my, like my kids, like so much less insecure than I was. He doesn't mm. really display yeah. the insecurities that I did. He kind of doesn't care. He, he'll try out for sports teams, doesn't care about, you know, what happens. He'll work out. It's not a big deal. Um, I, at his age was, this was like when my, I was, it was hitting at a super high level and I was just in the backyard working out two hours a day because of those insecurities. So I think a lot of it has to do also with just how they are with their parents and how secure they feel with, you know, being themselves. Next question is from Taylor Dinkle. You guys seem to be pretty confident. Do you have any tips on cultivating confidence in life? Oh gosh. You know, it's funny. The minute you stop caring, Dude, we are the best. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> We're the most confident. <laughs> you know, the minute you stop caring about um, what people think about you. Now, not all people. I think it's important to care about what important people care about you, like your the the good friends that you have and family members and your kids. But once you stop caring about what everybody else thinks about you, then you just be yourself. Mm. And it, and here's the other side of it. Do you want people to like you for being yourself or do you want people to like you for being someone fake? Because yeah. uh, that's an important thing to kind of understand. I too. think it's like developing a muscle. You know, it's a, it's a confidence is something that, uh, you know, it comes after you start to understand yourself more and, and you, you're secure in the way that you are. So like all your flaws in consideration and uh, really like just – owning it if it's something you want to change it comes from within like if if you're relying on other people to tell you you know this that the other too much about their feedback as opposed to your own uh you know pursuits i think you know that's something to evaluate but i i think it's just something that it just grows and develops uh you know the more you you, you bring back like your own like wh what do i want to do what you know where do i want to go with this what do i want to learn what do i want to change about my own uh, you know, body of things that are obvious to me uh, and just like try as much as you can to bring it back to, you know, your, your own uh, pursuits. Today you are you. That's truer than true. There's no one alive that's youer than you. Yeah, Dr. Seuss. That's right. I love that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, uh, that's Maximus's quote that's on his Instagram page. And I think that like I was asked like, I don't know, it was a couple of weeks ago when I did um, my questions. Like if I could hand my son one quality and that was it what would it be and it was confidence and i think that's really what it is it's, sal i think you hit it on the head like it, the, the reality is the the <laughs> the more you care less about it the more you confident you become mm -hmm. yeah and I, I remember this like in 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 high school like because i didn't have uh money i had crooked teeth i was the the skinny kid like grew up on the other side of the tracks like i didn't have in in the high school world i didn't have a lot of things that were working in my favor to become like a popular kid in school. And when you're a young kid like that, you care about that stuff. And the, the what I started to realize was as I was getting older and in, in, in growing up and in my teens, the, the more that I cared less about that and I was truer to myself and just was gonna be me, the more people that I attracted, like people are drawn to people that are like that. Mm -hmm. And so the people that I feel that struggle with this, they desire it so much that they get hung up on it. They're trying not to be them. They're trying to be somebody else to get the attention of other people. And this is what, what causes them to lack confidence is because they're not being real to themselves. They're trying to act a certain way or dress a certain way or be into certain things so other people will like them and they're not being true to themselves. 
if you just learn to be who you are, which should be the easiest thing you possibly could do, and be confident in that, that this is who I am and there's nobody alive that's like me. Mm -hmm. I'm unique. I'm uh, Every one of us are extremely unique and be confident in being different. You don't want to be normal. That would be the worst thing in the world is to be like other people. And so recognizing that you are so special, that you are so different, that you are so you, that nobody else can do you, and being true to that, you'll you'll people will gravitate toward you and people will be drawn to you because of that. And so it's just learning to love yourself for who you are. And that includes all the quirkiness and the nerdiness and the different the, the things that make you different from everybody else. Don't allow other people that and here's the other thing too, right? Because this is where this gets challenging, especially for young kids that are growing up, is when people tease you and put you down. The moment that you make the connection that when people tease you and put you down or make fun of you or point out the dip, the things that are different about you, that's a reflection of their insecurities. And so when you start to make that connection that it has nothing to do with you being unique or different, it has everything to do with that person is projecting their insecurities on you, that should build confidence in you. Like, oh, wow, this person feels threatened by this thing that's different about me, even though they're teasing or pointing at maybe an insecurity of your own them doing so is a reflection of their own shit. Once you realize that and you stand firm in who you are and you're like, fuck yeah, I am that person. I am confident about that. I am I am who I am and nobody can do me. And the, the, the more you solidify that, uh, I think the more confident you will yeah. become and the more people that you will attract. And you know what's different, difficult about this uh, particular conversation is I think it sometimes gets confused with um, I, I like who I am, therefore I never have to grow, change, or yeah. improve myself. Like, you know, I'm lazy. Uh, I don't take care of myself, but, you know, I'm confident and I care about myself. And that's it. You're mixing uh, two things up. Like one of the best ways to cultivate and build confidence is to seek growth, real growth, not like pretend growth that's driven necessarily by insecurities, but rather challenging yourself and overcoming challenges that builds uh, confidence. If you want a child to be confident, you allow them to encounter challenges they gotta be and, tested. and to fail and to try again and then to succeed. It's an amazing thing to watch when a kid, do, they've done studies on this, kids that are, that are raised this way will work on a puzzle much longer than other kids. They'll keep going, keep going to try and figure that puzzle out. So confidence is also built that way, is that, you know, I'm not perfect. That's okay. I'm comfortable in my skin. So it's okay. I'll, I'll tell the truth and I'll, I'll have that integrity. But I'm also trying to be a better person. I'm also trying to grow. Those things are simultaneous It's or, and they, they work together. It's not one or the other. Because I think sometimes people think, oh, you know, you just got to love who you are so therefore, that means I'm not going to grow because that's who I am and I love me. You know, that doesn't mean uh, that, that that's not what that means. No, that's the difference between confidence and cockiness, right? Somebody who's or narcissism. Yeah, that's it's cockiness, right? You think you you think that you you've arrived and that you're somebody who is confident doesn't ever think that way. They think that they're, that's right. That somebody who is really truly confident knows that, that that you know what is the what's the the stoic thing to say is that I know that I'm I, I know that I am wise because I know that I know nothing. Right? You are forever in pursuit of growth. And you are forever looking to grow and be better. And that's what makes you confident is being okay with, oh, okay, I lack in this department. Oh, mm -hmm. I could be better here. I'm going to continue to push that way. Yep. When you're the other person, when you think you've arrived and you're smarter right. than everybody else, you're better than everybody else, you're more popular. Now <laughs> you you're can cocky. recognize other people out there better than you at things. Yeah. And dude. you're fully like okay with that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, if you, I'll give you an example from a fitness standpoint, from a trainer standpoint, the trainer that lacks confidence is the trainer that pretends to always have the answers when the client has a question or a problem. Even though they don't know the answer, yeah. they're not confident enough to say to their client, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Confident trainers say, I don't know a lot to their clients. They'll say things like, I don't know, but I'll find out for you. That's uh, what real confidence looks like. Fake confidence looks like, I got this all under control. I know everything. I'm the man or whatever. You know, Look at me, check me out. That's a projection of uh, of insecurity. It reminds me of the you know it was a I was at eating dinner with Jessica. And we were eating at an outdoor patio at Santana Row, right? And you see a lot of nice cars in that area. And if you eat it, if you live in San Jose area, you know Santana Row, and you know that you're going to see two or three Ferraris or a couple Maserati, hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollar cars. And it was so funny that you'd see them drive by, 
And, you know, they'd be just driving by because there's a road there or whatever. And then every once in a while, one would drive by and they would rev their engine super loud. (laughs) Hey, look at me. Look at my, like everybody's already looking at you. You know, that's not confidence. That's, it's insecurity. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 With that, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Come check us out on YouTube. Uh, You can also find us individually on Instagram. You can find Doug at Mind Pump Doug. By the way, he posts a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Uh, mostly about podcasting, the art of podcasting. You can also find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Listening to both of them speak, but only one of them said something that actually kind of sparked something that made me want to do something different in my diet, just to experiment. All right. Um, And that was Paul. And when he, to your point you're talking about right now, when he started talking about, you know, plants, natural defense is for them to have toxins so they didn't get eaten all the time.